Jim Everard comes from uh, Microsoft. He joined Microsoft in 2007 as a senior director of engineering excellence for the interactive, interactive entertainment hardware and technology group. That's right. <laughs> so when I got that message from Jim, I went home and told my uh, son, hey, uh, a guy from Xbox is coming to uh, talk to me. And then their eyes kind of lit up, right? Is he bringing Xbox? <laughs> Jim said even he doesn't get three Xbox. No, I don't. In this role, Jim led a team responsible for realizing business results through improved product development processes and realizing the value of effective knowledge sharing. Prior to coming to Microsoft, Jim held multiple engineering roles, including systems engineer, the executive director of product development, and vice president of engineering. Jim holds, so you know why he said this, right? He's a very smart engineer next to rocket scientist. <laughs> he holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Kettering University. I don't know where Kettering University is. Midwest. Okay, from Michigan. And master's degree in electrical engineering from Santa Clara University and an MBA from the University of Washington. So we are looking forward to your home run. Jim, right. please join me welcoming Jim. So it's my privilege to be here today. Um, thank you for the introduction, Kiho. As, as Kiho mentioned, we did have a, uh, a, a, a great introduction to each other at a conference about two and a half years ago. And that's been very instrumental in terms of some of the journey I'm going to walk you through, because it's through connections with Kiho, introducing me into the broader knowledge management community, getting me engaged with some of the, uh, some of the forums, like the KLF forum, um, that has really helped me come up to speed and leverage the background of 10 and 15 and 20 years that, that a lot of people in this room and the people that I interacted with have had. I've only been focused on knowledge management as a discipline for about three years. So I'm a novice. So it's my privilege to be the cleanup hitter today. Um, I, Paul and Kehoe set me up. In my job, I try to manage expectations low. Um, they've done a great job of setting me the opposite one. So hopefully I can deliver. So just to set some perspective, um, Microsoft is a fairly large company, about 90,000 employees. It's known as a software company, but in reality, what people don't realize is Microsoft has also been building hardware products for over 25 years. And in fact, the hardware products and the consumer electronic focus of Microsoft is organized in our entertainment and devices division, which represents about 15% of Microsoft's overall business and, and encompasses about 10% of the employee base. Those are the four major brands that people should recognize around our consumer electronics business. I, as Keo mentioned, um, was brought into Microsoft as part of the interactive entertainment business unit. Primarily, the biggest part of that is the Xbox. And the hardware technology organization that I was a part of is, I say was because I'm in a new role. Um, but that hardware and technology organization um, was very focused on the Xbox hardware. In parallel with that, you see the flag here of hardware at Microsoft. We created a virtual community focused on developing our hardware engineering talent and our hardware engineering capabilities across Microsoft. And I, I led that, that effort um, and created it and led it to help develop that community. So I'm going to give you the perspective of knowledge management of our journey over the course of the last three years targeted on that small part of Microsoft, that small part of Microsoft involved in the businesses that are based upon a lot of the hardware technology that we develop and, and manufacture. Just so that I understand the audience, how many people here are involved in product development of one sort or another, whether it's hardware, or software, or anything? OK, so a good, good mix, OK? So I'm going to talk a lot about knowledge management in the hardware domain. I'm going to deal, we've, we've heard a lot about explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge today, and I'm going to approach it from both angles. I'm going to talk about the explicit knowledge side of, of what we've, of our journey over the course of the last two or three years, really focusing on the product development process. Product development process is one of the ways in which we capture a lot of that explicit knowledge. 
And then I'll talk to the tacit knowledge side, and I think you'll see a lot of connectivity between the explicit and the tacit side. So Michael McGrath, in his book, Next Generation Product Development, looks at the evolution of product development processes. And he claims that, that we're in our fourth generation of product development. And the fourth generation is really a shift of the, from the third generation, where the third generation was very focused on a strict process discipline of how you develop products. Fourth generation, uh, and, and in that, that, that generation kind of kicked off with, with um, well-known phrases like stage gate process processes and so forth. The fourth generation, he would say, started around the change of, 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 around the change of the century, around 2000, is really focused on leveraging technology to move beyond the strict process discipline of how to do things, and really using technology to drive collaboration, and really focus on the information side of product development, and accelerate the sharing and the benefit of that information. And in fact, we a lot of discussion today around ROI. Um, we don't focus on process, product development processes for the sake of product development processes, but you can go back and you can actually substantiate why product development processes is worth the investment. This, there's a lot of data sets that you could pull. This is one data set that, that I've tended to use in the last couple of years, pulled from, from the Aberdeen Group, which really, in a study of 300 companies, looks at five core business metrics around product development. And they draw a strong correlation across that study between those companies that consistently hit their targets in those five metrics and the fact that those companies have strong product development processes. They have strong program management focuses. And the more interesting point to me is a strong correlation to the fact that, they, that those companies are incorporating broader information sets into the product development process. They specifically call out supply chain knowledge, but they have a broad definition of what supply chain knowledge is. So that's, that's a huge data set that really helps justify um, the, the move to, to really focus on managing that information, figuring out how to accelerate the sharing and collaboration of that information, um, and, and ultimately capture the value out of that. The fifth one, the fifth metric, you'll notice is really around quality. And that's an interesting metric to look at because a lot of times when you talk about quality, people associate quality with product measures. They talk about manufacturing yields. They talk about field failure rates. A lot of other types of metrics like that. Those are all very lagging indicators. You're done with your product development process by the time you're looking at those metrics. I would propose that sometimes a provocative statement if I'm talking to a room of engineers, that product development teams don't actually create products. What they create is information. And they create information that defines how to build that product, how that product forms, what the features are, and how to support that product. And if you start to think about the product development process as one of creating information, and you start to think about how do I manage the control of that information, you start to think about ways in which you can start to drive leading indicators into your process that really start to predict the ultimate outcome of the product development process. So knowledge management, if you look at the product development process that way, this whole concept of knowledge management starts to get interesting to a core product development effort. And if you think about product development as generating information, it's not too hard of a stretch to look at that and say, OK, yes, the product development process generates a lot of information about the product, but it also generates a ton of other information. Product development efforts have tons of failures. They have tons of experiences. Tests go wrong. Tests don't have outcomes that you expect. When a test completes successfully and you get the outcome that you, you, you wanted, you actually, actually haven't generated much information. But when a test gives you an unexpected result, you have an enormous amount of information there. And how do you start to harness that information? That starts to really push us into knowledge management. That gets us into sort of the tacit side of things. So when I came on board and started looking at um, where the hardware side of Microsoft was in terms of the maturity of their processes and how they did their business, looked at it and I said, OK, how am I going to help move this organization along that maturity curve? And the last thing I wanted to do, and I heard it loud and clear from a lot of my constituents, don't give me a new tool. I already have more tools than I know what to do with. But there were some core, core things that we needed to do. And 
When I looked at this and I, I looked at the challenge, I said, okay, the best way for me to solve this was to go back and look at the product development process. And I came up with this, this system model view of looking at, at what the engineering world does, what the product development world does. Now you can look at this and you can say, okay, one view of this is I'm looking at blocks of different systems. And that's perfectly valid. Some of these blocks represent, could represent systems. I would proposition though that most of these blocks represent information and how does information flow between them? And what blocks, where, where's, where does certain information get generated? Where does it belong? So in the center, we have our product development process framework, which we call E2E. Guidelines and best practices around the things that we typically do at each point in the life cycle. Over here, we have specific design for excellence methodologies. Those start to look at things like design for compliance, design for comp uh, quality, design for reliability. Those specific disciplines that have some very specific methodologies behind them and are less about how you do things and more about how do you actually measure your success and effectiveness in those areas. The outcome of those two efforts tends to be a lot of product information, which, hits, which gets thrown into an EPIM system. But that's where, that's where the, the formal structured product data information resides. It's where it's sustained, and that's the pool of information that manufacturing and the rest of the business actually creates products and services them from. Those are all standard things. The, the area of opportunity for us where we really started to think about the fourth generation of product development and knowledge management, we're on the remaining two blue blocks. IE to E is the is the use is our approach at using technology to bring those processes and methodologies to life. Prior to having IE to E, these things existed in books. They existed on websites, static websites that people had to go look at. And you go look at a website that has hundreds and hundreds of pages of depth, and you you just get buried. You can't. It's really hard to understand the process. What technology allows us to do is look at that and say, all right, if you tell me who your project team is, if you tell me what type of project you're doing, I'll bring the process to you. Based upon where you are in the life cycle, I'll tell you what the best practices are that all of the other organizations and projects have learned. Look at those best practices, figure out which ones apply to you, and move forward. Leverage your experiences of the past. You don't have to go off and do the research and, and dig through all of this information. So that's what IE to E is. We'll look, a little, we'll look at each one of these blocks. And then what we call converge is that, that area of tacit information. All of that knowledge around the experiences, around the things, um, the, the key learnings that we had along the way that, that don't get captured in, in the definition of how to build a product. So when you think about all of these things, it, it starts to get very easy for me to talk to engineering organizations about the information that they deal with. It's not about the tools that they use, it's about the information that they, de they deal with. And then some of the gaps in, in where they don't have platforms, where they don't have tools, and then go off and figure out how to deliver those capabilities to them. So the E2E process, that hardware, that product development process, again, thinking about that fourth generation, one of the cultural things that we had to transition from was a hatred of the process because the process told me how to do things. And fundamentally, the minute you define how to do things, I don't need to hire intelligent engineers because I've got it all, the recipe is there to use Paul's analogy. But in reality, you can't, you can't, you can't recipe out how to do product development. Not only do you have to innovate in technologies and products, you have to innovate in your processes. And so by making the process a set of guidelines and a set of best practices, um, we are able to move to, the, to a culture of the fact that what we really need to focus on are doing the right things. The process is never an excuse for having a failure because you did things the right way. We, do the th we, we have to do the right things. There was a question. Yeah. Absolutely, that's a good question. So, and, I, and that, that'll actually come out in one of my key learnings at the end, but I'll answer it right now. This, the Enterprise Information Management System, huge corporate enterprise tool that is 
is the foundation of our business, right? That's what drives our factories. That's what drives our service centers. So that, we have an IT organization that maintains that. The rest of these, I've got essentially two people. One really focused on the process side and the DFX, and one focused on the IE to E, the, the implementation of that. And they both, they both maintain this. And, I, and I'll explain this one a little bit more um, in terms of the system administration tasks there. Excuse me, Jim. Yep. You can also cover what your processes look like. Are they documents or what are they? Or? Uh, I will give you that view right here. So that I'm not going to go deep into the process. But this is a very, very simplified, high-level view of our process. One could argue that, hey, you've just got a stage gate process there. But I would argue it's not a stage gate process. There's nothing here that stops work. And we're not controlling what work we do. I refer to this as a milestone-driven process. We have five stages of our life cycle. It's a milestone-driven process because the milestones, we're not analyzing the work that we got done. We're doing a couple of key things. We're analyzing the risk associated with the process and looking at the maturity of the designs, the maturity of the information that we have from our test results and other activities. And we're making an intelligent business decision about whether or not we're ready to start investing in the next stage. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily done with the last stage. And in fact, in this model, every single project that flows through this transitions over time between stages. So when you go to a new stage, you will always be closing out things from the prior stage. And it's about having that discipline of analyzing, making sure that project teams have looked at best practices and where they've said that those don't apply to this project, okay, at least have a specific reason why and be making that explicit decision. And then looking at what things you did, you do have to do and making sure that you're at the right, the, that you have the right set of information, that you are at an, uh, an acceptable level of risk to move forward. Are those instructions, are they capture some kind of database or some kind of system that presents it to you? So that's what the IE to E system is. And I'll get there in just a couple of slides. So these used to be spreadsheets that program managers ran around with. They used to be um, websites with a bunch of lists and, and documents. Um, IE to E is using modern technology to get rid of the mundane work, to drive collaboration, and allow people to work, regardless of where they are in the world, to work collaboratively and have that information available transparently to the entire team. So one of the two e e personnel knows that a project, develop, or product development team gets to a certain stage and then they push the information, the processes, the lessons learned for that particular, I mean, is that, is that, how, the pro, is that how it goes? So this view is very focused on the product development process and making risk decisions around are, do, are we ready to move the product forward. Built into this process is a key learning process where we capture more of the experiential stuff. And that is an opt-in by teams, usually supported by the management infrastructure. And that's, that'll be part of the Converge database that I'll, that I'll talk about. From a DFX system point of view, I left this slide in here just, just to, to point out that there's some rigor behind all of this. It's not all open loop in terms of guidelines and best practices. There's clear responsibility and accountability for who owns content, lots of different content types, who's responsible for the systems, and what type of information is, is, is housed and, and available in which part of the system. So corporate guidelines, you know, things around, corporate guidelines around safety and, and around manufacturability, around reliability. There are some hard and fast rules that every product has to adhere to. Right? You can't ship into countries without, without um, adhering to, to local regulations. So those are corporate guidelines that are well documented. They're not optional. But then you run over here into the E to E and the IE to E, and it starts to be more criteria about have you thought about these things? Have you looked at these best practices? Do they apply to your product? Because the, the same guidelines don't apply to every product. Every product is different. Every product has different market objectives. All the way over here to the Converge, which gets into the more of the experiential learning and, and capturing some of those experiences that ultimately get uh, mature enough to become best practices. And, and if they're really a good best practice, then ultimately they become a, a guideline. And they'll flow into the, into the process side of things. And if a guideline 
um, is absolutely imperative to driving business value, it may become a, a corporate operating procedure. So the information can mature and flow through this system, or information can just stay in one system, depending upon the value of that information. There was a couple of questions. No? OK. Yep. Uh, which uh, everything I'm talking about is yeah no it's 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 uh, we built it ourselves off of using our standard technology stacks but it's very tailored it's not hard it's not hard for me to make a stretch and say hmm it, you could create a product out of this where you could have a uh, you know a Microsoft very project oriented type of thing that's that's geared towards the process. But this was very tuned to the business objectives of our hardware organizations uh, and flexible enough to adapt to the different needs of the different organizations. So it's very internal. It's a very internal tool set. So then just a quick view of IE to E. Now, this is an eye chart. You can't read this. Um, but I can do a quick explanation. So IE to E, at a high level, I'd say it has three key values. Processes can be very complex. The life cycle itself is very complex. Some of our products are very complex. So there's a ton of information. There's a ton of steps. There's, there's tons of parts of organizations, both inside of Microsoft and outside of Microsoft, that have to be engaged at different points in the process. What this tool allows us to do is to ask some very fundamental questions when a project is started up about the type of project you have, who makes up your team, um, and what business unit that project is a part of. And with those very simple questions, we can start to pull together and deliver to the project teams the right set of process guidelines and best practices in a format using technology that allows those things to all be allocated to the right functional members on the team. So now the functional members are getting their work. It's, it's not a work breakdown structure like in Microsoft Project, but they're getting their process oriented and their guidelines and, and, and the previous knowledge brought to them. Um, based upon where they are in the life cycle and what they need. Now I have a very active collaboration tool. So this drives collaboration. Most projects that we do have team members in Seattle, have team members in California, have team members in Colorado, have team members over in China. It's really hard to collaborate with spreadsheets and phone calls that have to be held at 6 o'clock every night because that's when the time zones happen to overlap. With this, with the, we can't replace those. There's still a certain amount of that. There's still certain activities that you can only do that way. But this says, let's take all of the stuff that doesn't have to be dedicated to a specific time slot and that can be done asynchronously, and let's use, let's use technology to drive that collaboration. It then drives transparency. So not only transparency within the project team, every team member in, in the, on that project can see what's happening. They can see what's happening in the process guidelines. They can see what's happening in the DFX and whether or not we're where we think we should be at that point in the life cycle. They can see what's happening around all the risk, the issues and, and, and risk items and how those are stacking up. They can see who's responsible for it, what they're doing about it. Um, they don't have to wait for a project meeting on Friday to understand that stuff. So collaboration, transparency, and the final thing that it gives us is every project that goes through here adds a rich set of information to our knowledge that we can now mine and say, hmm, if all of our projects aren't utilizing this part of the process, is that part of the process value add? So now we have a very effective way of starting to improve, continuously improve our process. We can look at that information and say, hmm, if all of our projects are not hitting their baseline targets in terms of time to market, if everything is three to six months late, there's something wrong. And we can start to mine this information and find indicators in terms of where we might need to improve. So just having information about our prior performance on projects is a huge asset that we can do to drive continuous improvement going forward. There. Yes? This is, this is used as a, a project execution management framework and tool in terms of keeping resources synchronized with progress, or is it Right. This tool set does not attempt to do what a team would do in Microsoft Project. So that work breakdown structure, resource planning, and so forth, 
they would utilize, if they choose, they utilize Microsoft Project or some other project planning mechanism. This is really about our product development process. If you look at it as, as in terms of we've been doing hardware for 25 years, how do we make use of the 25 years of experience that we have in there? And when you go back and I look at it and I say, one of the reasons that, that Microsoft chose to focus on engineering excellence in the hardware space is that you could, if someone's involved in the space long enough, they start to see repeating patterns of mistakes, whether they're quality problems or delays on projects. And those repeating patterns are frustrating enough if it's happening inside of one business unit, but when you start to see the same patterns happening across business units, you decide you, you, there's something you gotta do, right? So this is really geared towards how do we make better use of that and how do we start to attack some of those systemic problems that a work breakdown structure isn't going to do for you. Yes, um, and this is not a readable chart. When it scaled, it wasn't readable. The other thing we track in this tool set is our project performance metrics and our product performance metrics. And we track how those change over time. And so at any point in time, the system might throw up a red flag and say, hey, you just stepped out of your 10% tolerance for X. And the team has to deal with that. This tool set. The other thing that this tool set does is it forces transparency because our entire management infrastructure has access to this tool set. So that transparency creates a lot of uncomfortableness, a lot of discomfort with project teams. And so that was a cultural shift that we had to get over in terms of how does our management infrastructure react to the information they suddenly have available to them. And that's an important process where communication plans and education really help in terms of making sure that you get the right behaviors and the appropriate behaviors um, all through the management hierarchy, including individual contributors. I have a question. Okay. Um, in this process that you're using, uh, I'm sure you have some critical uh, indicators. For example, let's say on the stage four that you're working on track, yep. and all of a sudden the marketing call you and say, some just launched a similar product. So you have to, let's say you have another six months mm -hmm. to the market. So how would you deal with all of a sudden that like, resources and personnel you need to so I would, I, I agree with you, that's a very good question. And I would argue that that is part of the portfolio management problem that this tool doesn't address. However, we, we one of the things that we've, that, that one of my fundamental principles is that this information, these tools need to work together. So we have a, we have another process for managing our portfolio of projects and making rational choices about priorities of what we deploy people against how are we reacting to competitive pressures? This information feeds directly into that. So if you start thinking about a portfolio of projects and, and timelines of projects across different groups, it's fed by this information. There's only one source of truth for this current dates, uh, the current status of projects, but it allows the product planning teams to be looking at that and saying, okay, I can drill down into this information at any point and understand how does this project compare against the comp competitive pressures we see coming forward and it helps facilitate those decisions. But those decisions once made, then we have to react to it here. So does this allow you to go in and, you know, you talk about um, repetitive patterns of mistakes. Does it allow you to go in and see maybe if there's a particular material you're using, that when you use that material, all the products have a problem, or a particular project manager, or some kind of? Uh, this does not capture that level of detail. So it's not capturing product specific information. There's no bills of materials here that reflect, um, that reflect, that would reflect material content. The best place where that would be tied together is if there's a specific issue on a project, the details of that issue and how we react to that issue are captured here and there'll be references to that material. So searches will, and, and data and that data mining of this set will, will uncover that. But there's not an obvious tie-in. When you find the repeating patterns, yep. then what, what process do you go through to figure out what's causing it? That's, that is, you know, that, that is, there's not a defined process that we have. That's where we have, we take our, our data analysts and we start to mine this data and we start to, yep, yeah. Okay, 
So that's it for the, that, that's the explicit side of things. Now I want to switch gears and get into the tacit side of things. And the explicit side of things is very easy to deal with in terms of organizations because organizations are structured hierarchically. And organizations are structured that way for lots of reasons. One of the things about organizations is a command and control. There's information, there, there's control of information, there's control of decisions, there's control of, of activities and so forth. Everything that, that I just covered is aligned with all that. It doesn't do anything to threaten the natural operation of organizations. When we start to think about the tacit information, the tacit information is really only valuable if you can start to share that information across organizations or even across groups within an organization. And that starts to open up Pandora's box. Um, you know, that Paul did a great job of, of, of breaking that story to or explaining that story to us today. And a lot of those things I think Maria hit on, I, um, uh, Virginia hit on, some of the resistances to, to implementing some of these technologies. Yet, fundamentally, they're critical to the success. Microsoft, the e &D, just the E&D division alone, is made up of multiple organizations of which are all very autonomous. And yeah, they all have different product types. They all have different businesses, business drivers, and market dynamics. But those are just the differences. If you flip that and look at the similarities, they're all doing 80% of the same stuff. They're all designing hardware products and software products and services. They're all designing, they're all doing power supply design. They're all doing uh, mechanical design. They're all doing thermal analysis. There's a tremendous amount of similarity. And when you look at it, the, the organizations are so, are, are so autonomous that oftentimes the senior principal architects and engineers and senior leaders in the organizations don't even know each other. So, so you've got to be able to break that down if you're truly going to drive productivity which is fundamental to our business, business performance. Because you, can't, you cannot afford to continue to do the same things in five different locations. Had lunch, had the privilege of having lunch with a, a couple of people from Pepperdine. And John, John shared a story with, with me about um, a program that he's starting up in the MBA school. At a point in the process of defining what that, what that program would be, he engaged the law, the, the law school. Correct me if I get this wrong. And they sat down, they started talking, and lo and behold, the law school was looking at doing exactly the same thing and spent a lot of energy to define the same thing. So it, this is not unique to industry. I think this is a very common theme across organizations regardless of, of what industry you're in. You have the same things happening in, in, in siloed organizations, and one of the key fundamental things that we can do with knowledge management is figure out how to break those barriers down and how to start sharing that information. Our approach to doing that was to look at communities of practice. In reality, there are a lot of, this stuff happens naturally. I think, um, I think both Paul and Marcy pointed out that this stuff is happening already. I think Maria even mentioned that. It's gonna happen whether we want it or not. The question is, is how much do we wanna harness the value of that? So we had active communities around tests. We had active mechanical engineering communities that the communities of practice, which are more oriented around what people do, what they're passionate about, it's not tied to their organizational structure. And that drives horizontal communication across groups within business units and across the business units. So our challenge was how do we tap into that? That's the converge block. And we said, okay, what we really want to do is focus first on connecting people. We want to make sure that we figure out how do we help engineers in the organization find who the experts are within the organization beyond their own personal network. If I'm a new person to Microsoft, I'll spend six months and I might know three or five, three, five, six people who are experts, truly experts, because it's within my business unit. When in reality, there's a lot of other experts in the other business units. So how do we make, how do we facilitate that connection? And then when we facilitate that connection, and there's actually dialogue and interaction going on and they're solving problems, how do we capture that information and make it so that it can be discoverable and shareable by others? A lot of similar themes that I think that we heard in some of the early earlier presentations today. And if we can do that, we're going to break down some of those barriers. We're going to drive the, the cross-organizational collaboration. And by, by capturing that information and making it discoverable and shareable, we will drive business results because we will start driving increasing productivity. Productivity, in my mind, is a measure of engineering effort and expense spent on driving future business, incremental profit, incremental 
incremental revenue from new products, new product categories, as opposed to that engineering effort put out, put out or, or expended towards sustaining your current businesses. So in the Converge world, we can discover, we can discuss, we can distribute, um, built on communities of practice. So unlike Virginia's community of interest, we manage this very tightly to being work oriented. We have other systems within Microsoft where we can have the skiing clubs and the backpacking clubs. This we manage specifically around communities of practice. Communities have to have champions. They have to have a business oriented objective. Just a simple illustration of how, of one way in which Converge works. If I've got a question, I can go into Converge and I can ask that question. I can do a search on that question or I can ask the question. If I do a search on that question, the system will use different search algorithms to search not only the information available in Converge, but we've gone through the hard work of, of connecting a lot of other information repositories within Microsoft to that system. Um, even our information systems tend to be very siloed, and they're siloed for good reasons, to protect confidentiality of information, to manage um, personal identifiable information, and so forth. Even different divisions have very hard silos between their information. But what you find when you look at it is development teams within the same business unit are free to choose the tools and the sources of data that they want. So some projects will go into one system manage all their information in that system. Others will go over into another system, and there's firewalls between those systems. So we focused on how do we break down those firewalls and guarantee the security and manage the interests of everybody that owns those systems, but, but make that information available. If the person doesn't find their answer, they can ask a question of the experts. Interaction with the experts, interaction with the community, that information's all um, that whole interaction is captured in the system and becomes discoverable and accessible by other people. Now, yep? Was that search mechanism, was that created internally? Was that something you created internally to then index to those different databases or data-rich sources? So the fundamental search technology behind this is Fast Search, which, which is available in, in Microsoft products today. So that gives us some some interesting advanced algorithmic capabilities. In terms of breaking down the silos, it was a matter of working through just the security measures that allowed either our index crawlers to have access to the right shares or to allow, to come up with a mechanism that allowed me as my identity to get access to specific shares if I was the one doing the search. And there's different performance issues depending upon how you do that, um, but we just had, we worked with our IT and. Uh, our different IT groups and came up with solutions that met their needs and gave us access to the information. Now, um, I said information in the system. One of my other key philosophies, which I think Virginia also expressed, is that it's, gonna, it's really hard to mandate people how, what, what system to use. So we, I, didn't, I don't focus my team on uh, unifying a central portal to go get all this information. Instead, I focus on, yeah, I want to have a single portal that if you like it, you can use it, but I also want to make sure that this, these systems are working um, with the tools that you already use. So a lot of people use instant messenger to solve problems. A lot of people use email to solve problems. The problem with those systems is that the information is only available to those that are on the thread. Sometimes that's two people, sometimes it's 12, sometimes it's hundreds, and usually those aren't the most productive emails. At any rate, we came up with, what we did is we focused on, let the teams use the technologies and the systems that they want to interact and to social network and make it very simple for them to make a decision and say, I want to now, with nothing more than a single click, push that into the system. Push that into the system in a way that the system can absorb that information, um, categorize it into the right community, and, and make it accessible to everybody. In addition, that's on the input. In addition, one of my requirements in the system was I want people to be able to access the information in the system. Yeah, if you go into the web client and the, and of the platform, you get a nice, rich interface. Problem is, for me to use that interface, I have to be logged on to CorpNet. I also want to enable people to access this information with the right level of security, regardless of where they are and what tool set they're using. So we, we have the ability to pull this information into different 
different different tools. So people can do searches. They can um, they can gain that that access to the information. So it really moves towards adapting to the, allowing the systems to adapt to the way people work, as opposed to forcing people to work to the way the tool works. And fundamentally, um, it's not too hard to figure out an extension to um, a return on investment and how you're driving business results. Fundamentally, these, these things that I talked about, I talked about the explicit side in the product development process and how it drives collaboration and how that collaboration and sharing of information can accelerate productivity in the engineering world. The same story is true here. By breaking down those barriers and sharing the experiential knowledge that different organizations have, any time that you can prevent one organization from experiencing the same failure, if you will, that another organization, or reinvent the same answer that another organization just did, you've just, you've just saved some expense. You've impacted the bottom line and improved productivity, not only in technology, but also in, in processes, in how the different disciplines are, are maturing. You've also given, you've given, if I go back to Paul's point about connecting, creating, and contributing, You've given your true technical leaders a way of expanding the scope of their mentoring, expanding the scope of their influence on a broader community, and getting credit inside the system for having helped other organizations. And as we can build out, and, and that gets built into some of our management by objective processes, where we expect our senior people to be able to do that. Now we have a process that actually can measure people's effectiveness or ability to do that. Not necessarily measure the effectiveness of it, but are they doing that? Are they making the effort? It's, uh, so change management is one of the, it, change management is one of my key learnings. Um, and I'd say that there are, my approach to that, and, and it's been successful in Microsoft because fundamentally um, every engineering organization, not just Microsoft that I've been a part of, engineers, engineers know how to do their job. And who am I to tell them how to do their job and do it better? So my approach to that is get small wins. Don't do big division-wide efforts. Do small things. Get some people talking about it. Get some easy wins. Um, and when you can start showing value, you have a much, it's just like, ROI discussions with executives. You have to have ROI discussions with individual contributors. Why is it good for them? How are you going to help them be better? How are you going to help them get the, the internal reward of helping others, right? There's all types of, of benefits that you can, you can hit on, but it can't be a philosophical discussion. You have to have easy wins with real trial experiences to demonstrate that. Do you put an incentive program for any of those? Um, a lot of this in certain, in, in different parts of the organization, like the organization that we trialed it in, um, there, there were specific commitments in our objectives that drive our appraisal process at the end of the year around contributing to these and, and, and using these, tool, these different platforms. Uh, okay, so wanted to just throw up this chart, not the best way of looking at data. Um, but it's a stacked rank data of different, different ways of measuring the usage of the system. And I want to point out two things. One, fundamentally, these systems are about the people and they're about the content. And these two spikes in here have to do with a physical event where we brought the entire hardware community together for information sharing. We had, um, we, we had external speakers, we had internal speakers, we had all kinds of activities, and we actually had tremendous participation in that. The community was, was, was really hungry for it. That, day, that, that single event drove a ton of, of, of usage of the system. Second major peak was around content. That's where we started to take a lot of the prior white paper repositories and key learning documents and starting to migrate them into the system as opposed to just making them accessible via, via search. That started to drive a lot more use. Now August, most of the company's on vacation. Um, usage drops off. We'll see, how this, this, uh, we'll see how this sustains, and we'll continue to do things like that to focus on the people and to focus on the content. 
So quickly to summarize, uh, lots of questions earlier today around driving business value. Tried to highlight some of that in this deck. Um, there's clearly on the explicit side and focus on process and focus on learning in that space. Um, clearly drives quality compliance um, and ultimately you can, you, you can incorporate customer experience into that. Transparency around the work and the status of things is a huge component of what I talked about. The organizational knowledge and enhanced team collaboration, just reducing the friction around connecting with people and connecting with information, ultimately will drive productivity. Direct productivity is either a reduction in OPEX or a higher portion of your spend um, driving new business, incremental revenue, and growth. Net benefits around time to market and just higher levels of innovation around both the technology, the products, as well as your process. Number one challenge, change management. Um, required a lot of work. Um, I would say that the other key element of that was consistent leadership support. While we worked very much from the groundswell in terms of understanding what worked for them and what they wanted and the value for them, we absolutely had to have core leadership support and sponsorship of this. And we had to be dealing with their concerns, as Virginia pointed out. We couldn't just ignore it. We couldn't just ask for support. We had to deal with their concerns and take care of their issues as well. How did we make it happen? It's an empowered team. The team was actually pretty small. Had a team of about five people, two of who were or one, one or plus one or two contractors. Um, and I had a dedicated communications manager. Communications around change management is key. I'm an engineer by training. I think I'm a fair, fairly good communicator, but I need an expert to do this stuff. I can't do it. So that was, that was a key fundamental thing in my mind for driving success here. Had to have a strong vision around the set of principles, things, and I, I hit on several of those principles. Um, had to have a clear change management strategy, and we had to have strong partners, and have strong partners with our IT organization. Fundamental, just not in terms of, hey, IT, how do we deploy this, but early on in terms of how do we solve these problems? Help us, help us architect this stuff. Um, we didn't rely on ourselves. We weren't the experts in developing these systems. Uh, we, we brought in outside, outside help to, to actually develop some of these. And where we had a core competency internally, um, we, we leveraged that. We ran, this whole, we ran all these things as projects. And oh, it's not on this slide yet. Um, we ran these things like a project. There are some Six Sigma um, black, black belts here. I made sure I had a Six Sigma black belt, not because I wanted the the uh, specific focus on Six Sigma Black Belt tool sets and methodology, but I wanted to leverage the methodologies. I wanted to leverage the mindset and the, and the, and the capabilities um, and make sure that, that we had that, that skill set in there. Mentioned the phase approach, um, diversity of the cross-functional teams. I involved, I involved the ultimate users of this. I involved them in the process of defining it and testing it, and we built in a process using, um, using agile development techniques where we got their feedback, and they didn't have to wait six months to get that feedback into the system. We made sure that we were giving them updates. Not, we didn't listen to everything they said, but, but a lot of the stuff, we gave, them, we, gave them feed, we gave them implementations of things every three to six weeks. And we didn't recreate processes. We leveraged the tool sets that they use. We leveraged the processes that you, they use. We might have improved some of them, but we, we fundamentally leveraged, and we started where the organizations were at as opposed to resetting where the organizations were at. And I mentioned the communication. Finally, moving the dial on this stuff, it's a cultural change. It's a journey. It's not something that you can say, hey, we're going to be done in a year. This is a journey. Um, it takes fortitude. It takes commitment. It takes perseverance. And it doesn't end with the initial rollout. So many things, and I've seen it in organization after organization, you roll it out, and ah, we have our system. We're done. Well, in reality, markets change, business change, your employees change. Things have to be kept alive. They have to adapt to the changing dynamics of, of the changing world. And so they have, to be, they, have to be, they have to be sustained. Keeping the whole process simple and scalable. Um, I talked about special awareness events like the hardware day. And just like in organizations, on these types of projects, you have to have succession plans. You have to know that your leadership is that you have succession planning around the leadership that's driving the vision and the implementation of this. Otherwise, you end up in a culture when I first got there, 
started, I talked to several of the people that we, I would ultimately be impacting, and their response was, you know what, I can duck my head for six months, you'll move into a new role, and this will all blow over. So succession planning around these efforts for continuity of, uh, continuity of progress, continuity of vision is, is really, really important. And in fact, I left that role um, at the beginning of this year, moved into a new role, and we have been very successful in continuing to drive adoption. And some of the metrics you saw in that bar chart were actually from the um, April and May timeframe of this year. So um, that, that succession planning has been critical in terms of that whole thing not blowing over. Um, that's one, th one element, plus the adoption and the value proposition, I think, is, is uh, taking hold in the organization. So that's it. A uh, few minutes left for questions. I ran a little bit over, but we had questions along the way. Now, in your explicit side, as you implementing the process, uh, you have dialogue going on with the engineers through your uh, asset tool. Yep. Uh, does there come a point where the uh, learnings are matured enough that you push it back into your explicit documentation and take it part of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. There was a question over here. Yeah, so on the tacit side, you talked about mentoring forward based on what you learn from unexpected results. That requires a certain honesty and reflection and willingness to talk about error, failure, or simply lack of prediction. Yep. I, I think it's a little bit different because if I understand engineering cultures, they're much more willing to celebrate unexpected results than other professional cultures. But even within your corporate environment, there's an awful lot of, of risk to talking about things that go wrong. How do, you, how do you get that stuff into the system? That's a really, really good point. And I meant to hit on that a little bit. I blew over it because of the time frame. But let's just, let's just take the, the, the converged system. Right? Free form dialogue around what you're doing in your work, that's a legal nightmare. Right? The minute you put something in electronic form, it's discoverable. Anything is discoverable. And, and that information can be used in places where we never intended it to be. However, I fundamentally believe that, so, so there, were, there was a push to say, okay, we have to censor information, we have to have automated rules to look at different types of content, and not allow this type of, we have to have people reviewing the content going in. And my whole point was, I may as well stop, because if we start doing that, nobody will use this tool, right? Social networking is not about command and control and structured engagement. It's about people doing what they do. So the way I won that argument is I said, look, it comes down to fundamental trust. If we can properly educate our people and we feel like we have the right mechanisms for, for educating people about the proper use, about the sensitivity of confidentiality, about the sensitivity of certain topics, Let's just make sure and hold ourselves accountable to make sure that every individual that uses the tool has the means of, of being aware of that. And then let's tell them we trust you. Now that you know the guidelines, use the tool and pay attention to the guidelines. And so far that's worked. The process has been in place. We have a history of being very leaky in terms of confidential information. Um, the process has been, in, we, we deployed the tool about a year ago, year and a half ago, went full division wide with it almost a year ago. Um, we, have, we have gone through several product development iterations in that time frame across different businesses with, with a much better performance in terms of confidentiality than we had the prior two years. So I feel comfortable that the trust element is working. Do you feel that that approach to corporate liability translates down to the, to the feeling of personal risk about talking about their personal um, relation, contribution to unexpected results? Um, I think that gets into a broader culture effort, and I feel comfortable that, and this is not true in every company I've been a part of, but in Microsoft, I feel comfortable that we have a culture in which it's safe to do that. And as part of that is because it's built into all of our mechanisms. We have a key learnings process. We have a, a uh, post-mortem process for the bad things that happen in the development, and, and there's no punitive element to that, right? So um, when we first started doing those on a very regular basis, we had to overcome that. We had to build that two-way trust. Um, but we have a culture where it was very easy to build that trust, and I feel 
um, you know, I've got very in internal, internal case studies of where um, behaviors are appropriately supporting the statement that we have that trust. Can I just add one comment to that? Yep. That I think when someone steps outside the boundaries and makes a mistake, that it is used as a teaching moment and not as a disciplinary moment. Absolutely. Uh, a long time ago on a bulletin board at JPL, I saw uh, someone had put up a sign that said, at JPL, don't lose points for the mistakes you make. You gain points for the recovery plan. Yep. And as a young employee, you know, a relatively young employee there, I, it really made an impression on me and has influenced me over my whole career. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I say the leadership in our organization has been very consistent in saying, look, a, a mistake is not bad. Yeah, it's painful, but, but it's, not, it's not bad. If you make the same mistake again, that's bad. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you maybe to build on that a little bit. You said one of the key uh, success factors was continued leadership support. What did that look like? What were some of the behaviors that demonstrated support? Um, boy, lots of different ways. Um, you know, our, um, our corporate vice president spent would would uh, was a key champion of this so he actually the four corporate vi vice presidents that sponsored the whole hardware initiative all key sponsors of this so when they had all hands meetings every single all hand meeting had some element of this stuff built into it they pushed down into their organization some of the mbo stuff management by objective stuff to make sure it was built in there um, just the fact that they were willing to um, spend their time around the community um, sponsoring the initiatives of this is important to us and this is why it's important to us. Some of them would blog about it, others hate blogging, that's okay. Um, like Virginia said, it's personal style, we're not going to force it. So just, just a lot of different behaviors and the fact that they were consistent about it. And they were consistent about it over the entire course of three years and they remain consistent about it um, has, been, uh, has been some of the key things. Yeah. Um, absolutely, um, absolutely. And the key thing there is that because we have this process in place, in those cases that I, and I'm not gonna point out specifics, but in those cases where it has gone wrong, the team has been very proactive about saying, okay, now we've gotta go figure out why this happened and make sure that we look at our processes and guidelines and don't allow it to happen again. And I would say that three years ago, that wasn't the natural part. The natural reaction was, let's fix this problem, get it over with, and move on to the next thing. That's not the normal behavior anymore. So um, hey, I would love to give you specific examples, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> not because they don't exist, though. <laughs> Good questions. Anything else? Kehoe's being kind and letting me run over a little bit. Um, and it should have had an S on there in terms of events. So a lot of things like, um, was it Marcy, I think, the TEMs? So we started doing the equivalent of TEMs that enabled that we would, some we would ask, others would volunteer um, to start hosting um, what we, I can't even remember what we call them anymore, but the equivalent of, of the TEMs, right? And we would, that would be an event hosted through the community for knowledge sharing. Um, and collaboration, and that information would then be stored inside our systems and made accessible. And it turns out that we would run about 40 to 50 people attending those, and we would run about a couple hundred um, offline viewing of those sessions, um, oftentimes remote people, um, but, but actually a high, high occurrence of even local people watching those events. Uh, no, those, those are about things that affect your, very, your everyday job. So, you know, low power design and instrumentation in cell phones. It could be about the architecture of the Xbox and uh, some of the trade-offs of those architectures. It could be outside speakers um, of technologies that are interesting to different parts of the organization. And we have such a diverse product set that we're never going to bring a speaker or a topic that interests everybody. But we're very, we're very focused on making sure that we're hitting interesting topics that cover everything, interests of, of every one of the business units at, at, through a rotational basis. So, so that's one thing. The hardware day is another example of where we just dedicate, and, and these things take a year to plan, 
they take a day to, day to happen, um, but they're all around celebrating the hardware community, our hardware capabilities, their open sharing sessions, there are specific networking um, activities built into that, and we just get, I mean, our hardware community of core hardware is about 1,000 people, and so uh, related hardware people, maybe 2,000 2, people. Um, last year, we had well over 1,500 people attend. Um, just amazing participation. So those types of things. Um, and then within the communities of practice, we will fund and sponsor specific events for those communities that they want to do. We don't, we don't come up with them. They come up with them. We'll sponsor and, and, and fund them. So that, that whole, that comes back to the person side. These things do not replace the inner, the, the personal interactions. The whole thing, the whole platform is designed to complement the personal interactions that you have and to accelerate the value of those personal interactions so that if it's appropriate, make it available to other people. And we provide a platform that, that enables that to happen. Excellent. Will you All please right. join me in thanking Jim for his talk? <laughs>